can I say a big thank you to Rob and to Kate and to Jerry for asking me to speak in this session. Uh, I wrote this presentation on the assumption that Jerry would be in the room, so for the next 20 minutes he is, okay, but get well soon, Jerry. Um, those are the thanks. My apologies are for um, departing wildly from the uh, title in the programme, which is a quotation from Marx, by the way. Which Marx? Groucho. Correct. Uh, and uh, we have a subtitle now. Um, and uh, I would also like to apologise to our organisers for the slander I'm about to visit upon them. Uh, Finally, I'd like to dedicate this one to my colleague, Cara Jones. Uh, she'll see why. Are we sitting comfortably? I declare, opined Dr. Waite, that one of the most agreeable pastimes in Bath during the season is taking tea with friends away from the hurly-burly of quotidian endeavour. And away from the prattling beau monde of our antiquarian fellows, replied Mr. Sutton. Fellows who seem as eager to talk for hours on how to set the world on a different course, as they are determined to allow nothing to change from our accustomed way. Indeed, murmured Dr. Waite, rubbing at a spot of tea on his fawn breeches with an elegant finger. I hear, interjected Mrs. Geary, that Mr. Hinton intends to tell us that our code of conduct is outmoded and that we transgress it daily. He claims that it is ethical to do so, and that the very principles of our code should be recast to mirror the way in which we comport ourselves. Mr Sutton sighed. How disagreeable. An ethical obligation to transgress the code of conduct? I do not like that proposition. I have not posted all the way to Bath, risking the highwayman on, on Hounslow Heath, to be lectured on ethics by a rogue. Explain Mrs Geary. As a temporary measure, he argues, until the code is revised. How absurd, agreed Dr. Waite. The idea that we should modify the rules of our society for the convenience of reflecting how we act, rather than amend our conduct to be in accordance with the commandments we have all agreed to. It is topsy-turvy. Contrary it may be, agreed Mrs. Geary, drawing a folded letter from a ridicule and consulting it carefully. But if I understand the burden of his argument, there may be some small merit in considering his proposition he claims that we should be pushing boundaries. That is a most unusual phrase, cried Mr Sutton. I have not the pleasure of understanding it. Does it have meaning, or is it merely two words combined as a husband brings together two beasts in the hope that the offspring will be an improvement on both its progenitors? Your analogy is indelicate, if I may, chastise Mr Waite. I believe that pushing boundaries describes how one might respond when we intuit that we should countenance acting beyond the narrow compass of the mores and rules that circumscribe our actions and our station for the improvement of both the particular and the common lot. And that is a generous response showing a great fondness for the comma, retorted Mr Sutton hotly. Might I suggest that were you to give equal favour to the semicolon, it would facilitate both your drawing of breath and our comprehension. It is not to be helped. It is how I am written, riposted Dr. Waite. It is the modern way affected by the daughters of clergymen and other wasters of good ink. <laughs> and as a scribbler's creation, I cannot but parrot my given words. I have no volition and nor do you. Gentlemen, gentlemen, tutted Mrs. Geary with an admonitory flick of her fan. And she does that. Do not become choleric. Let us continue. We understand that Mrs. Mr. Hinton wishes us to act in ways that out lie outside our covenant. Myself, I suspect that he wishes to behave in a way that is unseemly and seeks others to do likewise so that his digressions might appear less egregious. Hmm, muttered Dr. Waite. I observe that Mr. Hinton is not so confident in his profession that he is prepared to be present in person to expound upon it. Unless, of course, he is indisposed and has taken recourse to taking the waters. Had recourse to the alehouse, I would wager, responded Mr. Sutton dryly. Interrupted Mrs. Geary. Allow me to play my, place myself in his shoes, though the buckles do not become me, for the purposes of examining his argument. Our rogue levels his pistols at principle two of the Code of Conduct, which propounds a member has responsibility for the conservation of the historic environment. 
To be sure, a member undoubtedly has that responsibility, interjected Mr Sutton. It is a truth universally acknowledged. Just so, resumed Mrs Geary, but Rule 2.1 states, where such conservation is not possible, they shall seek to ensure the creation and maintenance of an adequate record through the appropriate forms of research, recording, archiving of records, and so forth. Quite so, again, it could have been written last week. I have no quarrel with the assertion, said Mr Sutton. But note the phrase, where such conservation is not possible, continued Mrs Geary. Does that not suggest that no excavation shall be countenanced unless the monument or antiquity is in immediate peril of destruction? Ventured Mr Sutton. That is not a contention that offends my ear. Mayhap it should a little, Mrs Geary suggested. Do not the Shire antiquarians, in pursuit of their duties under the planning policy of the Prince Regent's most excellent government, oft advise that they have but little objection to the obliteration of some relict testament to yesteryear, occasioned by the improvement of land, highway or canal, providing that there shall be made some expert antiquarian digging or record? Is that not a good approach? It is not all bad, for there is some good in it conceded Mr Sutton. A curator's egg then quipped Dr Waite. Very droll, murmured Mr Sutton, giving all the appearance of a man not the least amused. I will not press the argument, stated Mrs Geary, for it is not, it is not mine to press. Mr Hinton contends in his rough, untutored manner that the words, where such conservation is not possible, do not accord with the practices of the age. Where such conservation is undesirable or impractical, would be a more apt succedaneum. As ethical antiquarians, we give great weight to protection of the relics of the past, of course, but we do not give that consideration complete dominion over our curiosity. Are you never content to witness the uncovering of history, to promote our learned studies, even when our endeavours alone bring about the effacement of the subject of our inquiries? Search your recollections and I venture you will call to mind occasion when you have expressed great satisfaction with the fruits of such quizzing of our patrimony. Pray continue, replied Mr Sutton. I wish to hear the sum of this contention before I venture a response. I too, added Dr Waite online. <laughs> Very well, continued Mrs Geary. The rogue, the charlatan, expostulated Dr Waite. The mountebank, cried Mr Sutton. Fraud. Pretender, imposter, let him be what you will, cried Mrs Geary, growing impatient, but refraining from stamping her foot. Whatsoever he be, he challenges Rule 2.2, which states, where destructive investigation is undertaken, particularly in the case of projects carried out for pure research, the member shall ensure that it causes minimum, minimal attrition of the historic environment. Well, it deserves challenge, I agree, interjected Dr Waite. What, pray, is impure research? Our predecessors spoke of rescue and research, a most contrary way to order the world, for they believed that rescue and research served different purposes. We know now that all archaeology is research, for that which is not research is no archaeology. The ancients were wise in many things, but not all. Quite so, said Mrs Geary. Surely we would expect equal care and diligence whether archaeology be undertaken for curiosity alone or to temper the loss of a relic by augmenting its meaning and sharing cognizance of its secrets with society. Should we not say so? Well, that would be a statement of significance, conceded Dr Waite. Continued Mrs Geary. Is that universal care and diligence not what we would expect from a dedicated or professional, how might we call them, archaeologist? Uh, it, it's an inconvenience, stated Dr. Waite, but we cannot call them that because the word will not be coined until 1826. <laughs> Let us for now call them archaeologians. It sounds well enough. <laughs> and others use it. Mr. Sutton drew a deep breath. I concur, he said, that the, the words in our rules may not be the most appropriate expression of our expectations and some remedy might be beneficial. Yet I also fear to, that to some, to recast our obligations would be most offensive. I urge you to think on sleeping dogs and the merits of letting them lie. There is not need enough to push this boundary. Moreover, he continued, would not such an approach 
herald, uh, allowing us to protect or destroy antiquities according to personal judgments herald an era of, era of sophistic argument of on the one hand and on the other of ceteris paribus and consideratis and considerandis and all host of mealy-mouthed excuses that permit the venal and the lax to argue whatever their paymasters want. It might, said Dr. Waite, replacing his teacup on his saucer, but it might also permit those who are expert, ethical and trustworthy to exercise judgment for the better advantage of all. Leaning forward, he continued earnestly, now you know that I've always had the greatest respect for your learning and sagacity, Mr. Sutton, but here, sir, I discern that we have a difference of opinion. I cannot see you acting wrong without a remonstrance. It is badly done indeed. Let me tell you some truths while I can. To alter the weight of principle two, to disarm it of its certainty and to replace its easy dogmatism with a burden of careful consideration might be troublesome, but it would introduce an onus to think carefully about the significance of a place and act accordingly. Rather than pursue preservation at all costs, it might offend people, but I do not balk at the prospect. I regret that our band has more than once failed to do its duty for fear of the disapproval of its members. Sometimes offence and disapprobation are the price we pay for progress. He paused, took a pinch of snuff and resumed with vigour. This could be progress, my friend, because it addresses the very relation of archaeology and conservation. Our founding fathers, as the late colonials would have it, wrote our rules according to a system of values that does not tally with those of the modern age. As it is written in our code, conservation is preeminent and archaeology is its nurse or handmaiden and is called upon only to provide some small solace and relief when it is not possible to conserve or preserve. Mrs. Geary clapped her hands in delight. A novel persuasion has changed your tune. Quite so, resumed Dr. Waite. But why should archaeologians hold themselves subservient to conservation? Why cannot our charter and our rules correspond with our desire to be distinct, to be useful to our fellow citizens, and to allow us to achieve some parity of worth and esteem? Do we truly believe that relics are more sacred than knowledge? and that it is more important to cherish than to be curious? Let us have some confidence. Let us instill in our fellows a desire to rewrite the rules and so become more than we are now. Yes, I concur, agreed Mrs Geary. We are practising the manner by which these things are done. There must be a pamphlet arguing the reasons for change. There must be gatherings in assembly rooms where we work together on new rooms with reams of paper on easels and, 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 and large quills and smaller salons where lesser groups can repair for detailed discussions and there should be coffee and mineral waters and to encourage people to attend and share their views we must also provide luncheon and wine and to attract the largest number arrange for music and dancing of the quadrille and the gavotte. We would need big balls for that observed Mr Sutton. <laughs> One cannot have too large a party but I am persuaded it is a capital plan, and I stand ready to assist. What say you, Dr. Waite? There was a silence. You are muted, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, confound it. I have done it again, cried Dr. Waite in expiration. I am so useful to, be de to debate by correspondence that I find myself speaking aloud, and yet not a soul can hear me. I have lost the art of quality. It is a d d annoyance. <laughs> I was intending to say that you have uttered uncommonly brave words and I applaud you for your sentiments. But let me suggest to you a stratagem of caution. For yours is too much an assault on the front line when action on the flank might serve us better. What if, I ask you, we advance our argument in small measures, allegorically if you will, instead of positing our argument in the normal way, for example at a meeting, with a lecture, we could present it as an entertainment making our case but lightly, so as not to vex our audience. No, sir, we could not, responded Mrs Geary firmly. It would be folly to push that boundary. Some experiments are so assured of failure that innovation is mere recklessness, and the pleading of novelty is an inadequate excuse. It would not work, and none but a fool would try it. Thus chastened, let us leave them there, dear reader. The hour draws on, and others must take the stage. We have eavesdropped on a conversation 
and perhaps it has provided a little illumination. The candle that illuminates our dramatis personae is snuffed out, leaving small wispy wisp of black oily smoke to coil up to the ceilings. Let that smoky arabesque carry us along, for we are no great burden, and thence through the windows and air conditioning of the Apex Hotel into the airy sky above the city of Bath. We may gaze down from here and wonder at what lies below. Do the streets down there remind us of archaeologians? Look, the modern squares, circuses, terraces and crescents in honeyed stone speak of proportion, of presence and place, and remind us of our pride in logic and scientific inquiry. Look harder and we see the Roman town. It is redolent of order, organisation and orthodoxy. This is the town of Minerva, goddess of wisdom, crafts, expertise, professionalism. Look deeper again and she is Sulis, the syncretic sister to Minerva. She is our life force, our passion and our vantage. We see the trinity of science, art and humanities from this vantage point. And we see the trinity of subjects of our research, which are the buildings, the remains that are buried and the relics that are submerged. It is not only antiquarian research that can be, can, can be applied to these three components of what we might consider our most historic environs. There is conservation too. Now, dear reader, I'm, I must pause. I'm caught in a temporal snare of my own devising, for I, I need to look back on events that have um, yet to occur. Happily, we writers are granted the device prolepsis to remedy our careless chronologies, and I shall employ it now. Ascend once more with that little wisp of candle smoke, that little curly cue, and et voila, we see ahead two to three score years, and there is the emergence of the conservation movement from the long-established antiquarian tradition of inquiry. It will be a beneficial development, and we should be pleased. Our oak should support this ivy, for it brings a new diversity of flora and fauna to the branches of our discipline. But the ivy must not strangle the tree. Our trunk and branches must be distinctly visible and visibly distinct. We must not let ourselves be absorbed as some subspecies of conservation. Dear readers, for five and twenty years on Sunday have I served you thus. I have seen we archaeologists, the word will be with us before long, comprehend on occasion the uniqueness of archaeology, its distinctness from conservation. At other times we archaeologists have been confident in our value to others. Could these phenomena now coincide? Could we recast our values and our covenant and say, without shame and dissembling, that it is intrinsically good to be curious and it is right to explore the past and that we do not have to wait for some imminent destruction to excuse the exercise of our talents. Now, I've tried to convey a sense of regency rather than urgency, but a fat, lazy, indulgent principle rules over our ethical conduct. And now or later, we need to depose it. We need a ruler of our conduct that has integrity, honesty and purpose. We have never complied with a cuckoo principle that we never believed in, though perhaps once we felt that we should. It would be better to say what we believe to be true. Some will argue we should not change. They wish things to be more like they used to be than they ever were. Some will say procrastinate, others would caution, not yet. I would plead for change sooner. Our scales are tipped awry. They should not weigh places, structures and objects more heavily than people. We show people what they have done, who they are and what they might become. We should bid a timely adieu to rescue and mere record. We should recognise that our ethics define our code of conduct and not the opposite. We should be unashamed to allow the destruction of antiquities when that loss brings the opportunity to explore the past, to create knowledge, indeed to enhance significance even though the fabric of the past is destroyed, to entertain and involve all people who valued that knowledge and we should nurture the ethos of belonging and identity that we can bring them. People are of supreme import. Without them what we do 
has no application. It is a mere indulgence. Finis. <laughs>